So uh, friends, many of you know that Jason and I had some vacation about two weeks ago now. Um, we spent eight days in Missoula, Montana and kind of areas around there. Jason grew up in Missoula. And part of where we also spent some time was um, we spent two, late, two nights on Sealy Lake, which is where his, hi, where his, uh, hi, where the, uh, where his family has a cabin. And, uh, and so especially during that time, we just had like the epic, like forming summer memories for our kids, right? Like just like the best stuff, stuff of childhood and summer. So like roasting s'mores around the campfire, fishing and rafting and playing at the beach and throwing horseshoes. And we also spent some time on the boat. So doing some tubing and water skiing. There's this moment I was on the tube with June. We went slow enough that like she just like dipped completely under the water. And I was like, whoop, <laughs> let's just like get you out of there. Uh, so a lot of just great moments. <clears throat> During which, too, like on the, on the boat also, there's a moment where uh, Levi got to drive the boat. And you may have seen this on social media. <laughs> just, just awesome. There's also like a little video that I wanted to show you of it where his hair is just, whoa, sitting there on Grandpa's lap. And he just was ruling the world. It was awesome. And it was just beautiful. And you can see a little bit of the blue sky. It was just awesome, awesome time away together as family. So... Holy hair, Batman for my son. Okay, um, so it was awesome. We even survived the nearly 10 hours on the road out and then back, uh, so it was good. While we were on vacation, I found myself establishing some really good rhythms in my day. Yes, it did include kind of a local brew about 4 p.m. in the afternoon, which was lovely. Uh, but also I felt myself falling into this great intentional rhythm of how I set my mornings. And I was up reading and journaling in the morning before my children were up. And I was out for a run or a hike six out of those eight days that we were gone. And those two practices are so, so good for my soul. And I know for some people you're like, ew. <laughs> like that's just not your jam and that's totally okay. But for me, that was just so just good and life giving. I also intentionally uh, took a step back from my phone and being on social media and email, and, and I was like, oh yeah, this is what it's like when my brain has time to just be. When it's, you know, I'd forgotten what it's like to not have a steady stream of stuff coming into my brain all the time. And so I just had fresh space for ideas to reflect on my life and the world and just to play, and I found myself, and I want to say it this way, I found my heart beating in rhythm with God. If you would, would you please close your eyes and get comfortable and find that heartbeat of yours, whether I find the throat spot a really good one, but your wrist might be good. Uh, just close your eyes and, and pay attention to that pulse, feel that rhythm, and breathe deeply and feel that heartbeat of yours for a moment. And you can kind of just keep your fingers there. I just have two questions. Um, you can just shout out answers. At what times do our hearts beat the slowest? What's that? Sleep, for sure. I think that is officially the slowest <laughs> our heartbeat gets. And just times of, of rest. You know, we want to get, doctors always want to get that resting heartbeat of ours. And then what are the times, the occasions that cause our heart to beat very quickly? Anxiety. Anxiety. Amen and amen. Amen. Panic, yeah. Driving in traffic. Driving in traffic. How about public speaking? <laughs> yeah? After exercising. After, yeah, after exercise and during exercising too, for sure. So when you're excited. When you're excited, yeah. Yep. So I want to make the, the point, the argument today that we need times when our heartbeats slow down and times when our heartbeat speeds up. And that's true considering our physical health. You know, I mean, these times that physiologically our heartbeats slow down and times when they speed up, like we need rest and we need exercise. Maybe the driving and traffic anxiety panic pieces, maybe not as much, but we, but we need balance of both. But we also need our heartbeats to align to, in both slow and quick ways with the heartbeat of God. And today specifically, we're going to explore the necessity of our heartbeats finding rhythm with God in times of rest. Rest. If you and I were to sit down and have a conversation about what rest looks like in your life right now, what would we talk about? Where are those times? What are those ways in which you find rest? 
And I'm not just talking about like taking a nap or like the physiological ways in which like we, we you know, we rest. Uh, Cause I know for me going for a run, that's rest for me. But what are the things that refuel you, that reconnect you, that bring you life? So we've talked about this before at Salt House. We've talked about rest. And uh, to talk about the rhythms of God, though, this summer journey that we're on, to talk about the flow of God, we absolutely must talk about rest. And we must come back to it again and again because rest is central to who we're designed to be. And it's always a battle to make it happen in our lives because it's absolutely countercultural to how we are told to live, right? So as we begin this conversation today, again, I want you to just kind of tune into that sense of what are those places, those ways in which you find rest and rejuvenation, kind of be, okay, accessing that, uh, both like what are the things that you do already, but also what are the possibilities of what those rhythms might look like in your life now? So we're just going to hold that kind of prayerfully in question as we go through this. But I want to dive into then uh, why this matters, what it means, uh, where it comes from in scripture, and explore this together, okay? You with me? Your heart, heart still beating? Still good? Okay, all right. So uh, in the Christian story, the word for rest is, is the word Sabbath. And actually, in the, in the Jewish world, it is also uh, the word Sabbath. Uh, Sabbath means to cease, to stop. So notice that, yes, it does mean resting, but it's also, in a sense, more than that. It's, there's a distinctness of stopping something, of ceasing from something, And to see what this looks like, it's always helpful when we're examining the Christian story to look at the way Jesus embodied this. And so Jesus shows us a lot of of things, Uh, but in in this, uh, as we look through this lens of rest, it's important to notice how Jesus actually worked really hard. He actually shows us the importance of of working long days. And, you know, he was teaching and healing and walking and talking, and there were crowds around him so relentlessly. And yet Jesus demonstrates this rhythm where he moves back and forth from work to times of rest, of getting away, almost like a pendulum swinging back and forth from work to rest, this rhythm. And we observe him then taking time to be away from the crowds, to pray, to be with his friends, to find that time of reconnection with God and with who he he is. So to cease, to stop, Jesus absolutely shows us that. Jesus also uh, spoke and taught specifically about the Sabbath, saying, okay, this is the way it is. Uh, So he lays it all out there, and he teaches about the Sabbath too. So it's one of these moments in Jesus' life that we're going to look at for today. It's from Mark's Gospel, which means we've heard from it before. If you were here uh, since the beginning of Salt House, you know that we've spent a lot of time in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, so we're, we're reviewing, we're, we're revisiting this squabble that uh, Jesus has with some of the Pharisees, as he tends to do a lot. And, and it's over what the Sabbath is for. And the Pharisees are, again, uh, just to review, they're the super religious guys. You know, they're the rule makers, the rule followers. They see themselves as upholding God's rules. And they're usually portrayed in picture as grumpy old people in lots of robes, so like Pharisee. So uh, it's these guys. Um, And over and over again, Jesus bumps up against the Pharisees, their expectations and their assumptions about God. And Jesus points to God over and over again, not as this one to be fearfully held as a rule-enforcing deity, but as a relational God who cares far more about people and the transformation of the human heart and the redemption of the world far more than about the rules. So the squabble centers around Jesus' disciples pulling off uh, heads of wheat to eat on the Sabbath, which technically breaks the Sabbath law of no harvesting that can happen on the Sabbath. And so um, we're going to hear from this text. I want you to imagine it unfolding, and then we'll figure out what's going on in this and why it matters for us and our heartbeats. So I'll have... Stuff coming up and read. And she's not holding mic, so let's do this one. You're good. I'm way shorter than Jason. Wah, wah, wah. You can shift over that one. No, that one's better height. Do it. All right. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples walked along. They began picking some grains of, it's a cream, sorry. The Pharisees said to him, look, Why are they doing this, what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered, 
Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate <laughs> consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humans, not humans for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Thank you, Steph. So again, that's Mark 2, 23 to 28, and um, as always, there's many layers to what's happening here, which we could spend all day talking about. You want to talk about it all day? We'll just stay here, order some pizza? No. Okay. Um, yeah, you're okay. Let's, no, okay. Another, another time. Because uh, it's going to get hot in here later, actually. So, um, but I really want to zero in on just this bold statement that Jesus makes at the end, where he says, the Sabbath was made for humans, not humans for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for humans. So the Pharisees, again, they're making a stink about following the rules, the Sabbath laws specifically, and Jesus is saying, you guys, you are missing the point. God made the Sabbath as something good for us. It is a gift. It it is for us. It's not about following the rules at all costs, but about experiencing the fullness of God, the rhythms of who we are. Jesus is saying Sabbath is made for us. To cease is rooted in the core of how God has designed us. Sabbath is one of those themes also that's woven throughout Scripture, uh, including at the very beginning of everything. When we open up the Bible, we turn to the very first pages, and, and the very first pages of Genesis, we have the two stories of creation. And the first one is a creation story of God creating the world in how many days? Seven days. Uh, it's a seven-day narrative around the creation of all things. And on which day did God create people? Six. Six? Six? Yeah. It's six. Yeah, yeah, it's six. You can go six. Yeah, Uh, day six. So, uh, and this is what it says about day six from Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Man, so just pause and notice how God created man and woman in God's image. And we've, we've heard this. But just sit in that. The imago dei is the Latin, very poorly pronounced, uh, but that's what, that's what this is, being made in the image of God. It's a whole like doctrine within the church. It's a big deal that we are made in the image of God. So for us, the word image, I think it causes us to think of um, photographs, Uh, selfies, Uh, you know, a mirror maybe reflecting back the likeness of someone, but there's no photos and mirrors at that time, right? So I think a better, more accurate word would be the imprint of God, the imprint or impression that God left God's handprints on us as God fashioned us, as God created us, that there's this smushing of, of, of God's hand in us where God squeezed us into form, this impression, these fingerprints. So we're marked, we are defined then by these fingerprints of God. We hold that imprint, we hold that image, that heartbeat of ours, at our best, the rhythm of God is one that we find when our hearts beat in tune with God, when we are in rhythm with this image of God that has marked us from the beginning. So again, that's day six. People are made in the, in the image of God. Then what's fascinating is what happens next? What happens on the next day? What's day seven of that creation narrative? What happens? Yes. Takes a break. It's a rest. Yeah. Whew, done. All right. Uh, so on day seven, uh, this is what it says. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished in all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done. And he rested on that seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. So what did God do? God rested from the work. There's that sense of like, whew, again, just like, oh, we did it. All right, good job. You know, like take that day of rest. But what I want us to notice is what people do. People are made, you know, on day six with the imprint of God And then there, our first day of existence, waking up in this new world, is a what? A day of rest. That's where we start. That's the first thing that we do. 
rest with God. Rest with the one in whose image we have been made. Sabbath then happens first for us to cease, to stop. It's a gift that is given at the creation of all things. Sabbath is made for us. So my friends, as we consider the rhythms of our lives for you, is rest where we start? For most of us, probably not. I had, I had such a nice rhythm of rest while I was on vacation in Missoula, and, but now that I'm home and back in the grind, it has been so hard to maintain that rhythm. I'm like zero for however many days I've been back. You know, like it is so hard to maintain that rhythm. Um, I've been overwhelmed in this past week just how, by just how hard it feels to make that time. So aware of that, and yet also holding in tension with like, gosh, my whole body and spirit, and yes, my heartbeat, like longs for that kind of rhythm and that kind of time. But I like, I love the idea of being out before my kids, reading, getting some exercise in, but then it's like actually morning and I'm in my bed. <laughs> and um, it's a little harder uh, when I'm actually in that, in that moment. And I wonder, friends, do you now, do you ever feel that tension? Like the man, yeah, I, I, yeah, this is so hard, and I so desperately want this kind of rhythm in my life. It is hard to find Sabbath, and yet feeling so aware of how we desperately want it. So I want to say a little bit more um, about what Sabbath does in us as we kind of move through this. Sabbath, this ceasing, it holds space for us to remember you know, who we are, to come back to that place of that image that we bear. And it's, it's interesting because the, the Jewish people throughout the Old Testament and Jesus' time, for them to honor the Sabbath was a visible statement of identity. Like people would recognize that this is who they are because of like, well, they, they don't work on this day when everyone else would keep working. People notice that they live differently. And so it is for us. We remember who we are. We have, when we have that discerning eye then to like have space to call out how we, how we have maybe not been true to that imprint, that image that is on us, and to, to move back into that space of remembering who we really are. And we've named this before, that, that in our culture there are three great lies that we are told that try to define us, that we look to for our sense of identity, and, uh, and they are these. I am what I have, I am what I do, and I am what others say about me. Like, that's the place where we can easily find ourselves spinning. And Sabbath is holding that space to step away from those external things that try to define who we are so constantly uh, and coming back to that place. Sabbath holds that space to defiantly remind our hearts, okay, I am not what I have. I am not what I do. I am not simply what others say about me. Instead, Sabbath creates that space in our hearts to beat and rest and rhythm, to slow down and to remember the imago dei, we are made in the image of God. When was the last time your heart beat in tune with that identity? So as a supplementary kind of tangent, um, for those of us who do like to work hard and to be productive, I mean, I like that. That feels good, you know? Uh, I, want, I want us to name this too. So making time for us actually makes us better workers with better results. And I've said it before, I love it when scientific research actually proves or aligns with the life of Jesus, when it's like, oh, look, Jesus said this, and science says it too. Like, I love, I love that, and this is one of those times. Science absolutely supports the value of rest. For instance, various studies have said this. Research that examines the relationship between hours worked and productivity found that employee output falls sharply after a 50-hour work week, and it falls off a cliff after 55 hours, so much so that someone who puts in 70 hours produces nothing more with those extra 15 hours. Isn't that fascinating? Oh, do you find that true? I mean, I don't know if you've ever worked those. Yeah, Karen's going, yes. The answer is yes. And, and to stop working, to cease because God created us that way and because the extra time working is actually not producing more. I love that. I find it very hard to live that, but I love that there's this support there to draw us into that space. So my friends, uh, I wanna have some conversation then about what this actually looks like because we don't have Sabbath laws um, of Jesus, 
of Jesus' day, so there's no like, here's the things you have to do. Here's how you maintain Sabbath. You know, it's like, okay, good, here's my prescription. I'll just go do that. It's not that way for us. It's not quite that clear. So what do we do? What does Sabbath actually look like in our lives? I want to spend some time unpacking that. So Sabbath rest, again, it doesn't just mean slowing the heartbeat down literally and taking a nap or, you know, though you can definitely take a nap. That can be a part of Sabbath, but it's also a lot more than that too. So let's, let's start with what we know. Sabbath, uh, again, it means to cease. And I think specifically say to cease striving, that it's that, that stop from trying to produce and be productive and, yeah, and strive and to rest with the one in whose image we are made. So that's what we're talking about when we say the word Sabbath. So to close out our time, I want to lead us through what I hope will be a practical reflection on helping us each identify Sabbath practices and take some steps to put those into place. So I invite you to pull out that bulletin insert if you, if you haven't yet. And um, the text that we read through from Mark is on there, um, as well as some questions that we'll kind of walk through a little bit. Um, there's some pens passed out if you need some. There's some on the table over there. Um, but let's go through this together. So, so we begin by asking kind of the what questions. Um, I want to ask it this way, uh, where it says, what are the places, what are the practices, and the people who renew you and remind you of that imprint of God on you? Um, that first question in your bulletin, it says just, what is Sabbath for you at this time? But what, is, what are the things, the places, the people that ground you? So again, to be perfectly clear, this is a question that only you can answer for yourself. Uh, and the answers keep changing in our lives. What Sabbath looks like in my life now is very different from when I was in college or when I was newly married without kids. Like it's, it's, It changes with the seasons that we have. It's even different than it was a year ago. So what does Sabbath look like in this season of life that you're in? So here are some practices that I know are Sabbath practices for folks that I know. Swimming, painting, video games, cooking, baking, reading, specifically reading the Bible, uh, meditating, praying, running and exercise, relaxing with friends, hiking, playing music, gardening, puttering around the house with no agenda, playing with children, watching movies, sailing, journaling, mowing the lawn, being in worship. And for some, I think there's also a place that restores us. People speak of like a particular walk or hike that they like to do, uh, a place of vacation that they go to regularly, a particular friend's house that is just a really renewing place, a favorite coffee shop or a pub that you visit. Um, so that's kind of the what question. So again, that, that can look a lot of different ways. Uh, but there's also, um, then there's also kind of the, kind of the next questions that we get into. So, I, but I do want to say a lot of things fall into the what category, just make sure that we get that. So there's also the when. Um, I want to suggest again for practicality that there are different kinds of rhythms to pay attention, attention to, and they will be different kinds of things that we do in those, different, in those different whens, those different times. So Sabbath can look different daily, weekly, kind of monthly or quarterly, and then yearly, annually. So again, to look at different kinds of practices. So again, I, I encourage you to keep making notes as we go through this, if stuff comes up for you, and just engage in this very prayerfully and intentionally about what God might be nudging you to do, again, because we're wired for this stuff. Um, but again, it takes, it takes intention to make this kind of space. So um, let's kind of work through these, just to talk a little bit about uh, those daily rhythms of Sabbath. So daily can be hard. It can be hard, hard, hard to find those times daily, especially um, if we have a job and or kids and or other relationships. Anyone have any of those things? Um, yeah, so those get in the way. Uh, <laughs> those are beautiful things that are part of our lives, but kind of fitting the pieces of our day uh, can be hard. So here's the bottom line, and I've said it before. Daily Sabbath is the five minutes of stillness that you find. It is the five minutes. And obviously it can be longer than that and wonderful when it can be. But seriously, it is using the few minutes of privacy in the bathroom strategically. Parents, can I get an amen? Okay. Um, it is um, you know, using those five minutes to listen to a podcast, to read a daily uh, Bible verse, to pray, or to use those mo few moments before we get out of bed, like being intentional about what we're thinking about, praying about before we put our feet on the floor or at the end of the day or what we're doing as we commute or as we take our lunch break from work. I have a friend who has a daily alarm in her phone and it goes off at lunchtime and it simply says, be still, with an exclamation point. And she just uses that as a reminder. She often steps outside into the sun, 
just breathes deeply or she'll pray, she'll practice gratitude, she'll open up her daily scripture for the day. Um, so what kind of alarm or reminder might be a good trigger, a good thing to kind of set you on course that could come up during your day? And we say daily, knowing that if we try to do it every day, we will get it most days, right? It's like, and that there's always grace when we're like, oh, didn't get it today. All right, but there's tomorrow. Sweet. So just saying daily, knowing that, well, we're going to do the best we can. And so what about the weekly rhythms? So Sabbath is ceasing. Um, you know, often Sunday is named as, as the Sabbath, and, and it is, and it can be, and it should be. For me, Sunday is not so much of a Sabbath day. It's, it's a lot of work, and, and it's wonderful. And so it's also looking at the rhythm of your life, knowing that it may not be Sunday. It may not be a full day during the week. It may be a half a day. It may be two hours that happen. I know for me that it, there's no set time, but it falls during my I have Friday and Saturday off. So during those two days, I'll find kind of space for that. It's often during the, like, the afternoon nap time window uh, where I can go, get out for a run while well, Levi's napping and June's still in school and like, there's just like good stuff. And Jason's home, so I don't just leave Levi at home by himself, but just in case you're following along. Um, so you know, it, it, it's different depending on the week, but I just know that I need to make that time. Um, but it often is too. It's like the, the date night or the connecting with a friend for coffee. It's those kinds of times too. But what are those, those weekly times uh, those touchstone moments that give you a rhythm to the week, reminding us of who we are. The monthly or even quarterly kind of rhythm too, um, those are things that can be a little bit more significant. Uh, it's like the big hike that's really good for your soul. It's getting out to see a movie or playing on a, a team or a, uh, playing a sport. It's serving, it's engaging in the community in some way, but kind of like bigger picture things. Um, yeah, that, that we kind of have to make more time for and more intention for. And then also then annually, yearly, what are, the, what are the touchstone places for you? It's like every summer, this is what we do. The Benoits just got back from Montana too. So I mean, that, and you were saying you go every summer, right? Like that's the thing. I mean, I, I would guess that is a very much a Sabbath practice for you guys. Definitely. Yeah, reconnecting with family and play and awesome hair on the motorboat like Levi. Um, so... So what are those kind of annual things? And it can be vacation types of things. I think those are incredibly important. But it's also like how, you know, you have the like kickoff to summer barbecue every year and the neighborhood comes. Or, you know, like there are different kinds of practices that can be, be annual things. The way in which you honor your birthday or someone else's birthday. Those ways, again, in which we come back to remembering who we are. Retreat times. Those kinds of times. So my hope is that through asking these questions, and I really ripped through it fast because there's kind of a lot to cover, so... You're still like making eye contact, so I think we're good. Uh, but so thanks for sticking with me. Uh, but my hope is that asking these questions through this, God will continue to nudge us to place rhythms of Sabbath into our lives, because it takes intention, it takes choice. And I will be first to confess that I have felt a bit paralyzed about making time for Sabbath in my own life. Because I feel like there's so many things that I want to put in place. Like I look at this list of all the different things that I just made, right? And it's like, there's too many. I can't like do any of it, right? It's like too much. So I'm just going to claim that for myself, um, how it's just hard. But which is why I'm preaching on it today, because I need to hear it. Uh, so there you go. But my friends, with grace and with hope, let's each start with one thing. How about that? So even just one thing for this week, or maybe in the next two weeks, if you need a little bit more grace time, like what's something that we can each commit to this week? One commitment to letting our hearts beat in rhythm with the God of the universe. So the band's going to come up and provide some music, and, um, and you're welcome to sing along, but I would also invite you to kind of sit and rest and listen and make notes, continue to put things on your calendar or set that alarm on your phone or make a note to look up a reservation uh, for your favorite restaurant or retreat center or whatever it is, like kind of make some space, a reminder to call a friend of yours, whatever it is. And um, as, we, as we continue to make that space for identifying Sabbath practices. And um, again, if it's feeling overwhelming, then just focus on the one thing, one thing, and start there. So but before we do any of that, can you put everything down in your lap and close your eyes? And again, put those fingers on your, on your neck or your wrist and feel that pulse, that heartbeat of yours. And let's just take a moment to breathe and to pray. God, 
our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer. Thank you that you have made us in your image with your fingerprints all over us with the beating of your heart at work in us. How easily we forget who we are. We forget that we are made in beauty and wonder and marked by you. So in this moment, God, we claim once again who we are as your people, people who have received the boundless love of Jesus made known in the life of generosity and sacrifice that he lived among us and through the pouring out of love on behalf of all people in his death and in the overthrowing of evil and darkness and death in his resurrection. We remember all of this as who we are, beloved, redeemed, empowered for life. And in these moments now, we rest with you. We let our heartbeats slow and strengthen as our hearts find rhythm with you. And in these moments before us, we set aside intention to commit to ways in which we long to step more fully into the flow of God as we find those ways to cease to Sabbath with you, remembering who we are for the sake of ourselves and the sake of our world. We abide with you now, together. There's a whisper I can hear it when I'm quiet Abide in me Abide in me When I feel My troubles multiply Abide in me Oh